Warsaw. Um, I'm born in Austria, studied in this city, went abroad. Um, I'm a passionate entrepreneur and I founded CISC Semiconductor around 22 years ago. So what we do, what is my passion? We are working in a connected world and we try to connect things. We try to add uh, trust in, in this connected world. So what does this mean? So everybody has a smartphone in and you trust if you do payment with a smartphone, it works out well. So that's why uh, CISC is in that game and make sure this works properly. If you drive a car and the sensors in your car communicate properly with the control unit in the car, that's also a topic where we are deeply in developing the chips uh, with our partners and partnerships uh, are the topics. So being an SME is not all. So I'm pretty much also in connectivity here, collaborating with other companies. And I think that's, that's one of the, the topics we are going to address in Society 5.0 and I hand over to Verena. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Verena Vescoli. Uh, I'm leading the corporate R&T in AMS and Osram. By the way, there is still a mistake. Uh, the new brand name of the company is AMS Osram, since Osram joined the AMS family. Uh, our company is, major, uh, is leading major transformation in three particular areas. That's visualization, illumination, and sensing. So I feel very comfortable in this discussion today as the company I work for and I have the honor, honor to work for is, is really very, very busy and leading major breakthroughs in innovation in exactly the areas which are driver areas for Society 5.0. And I hand over. Thank you. That's all my name is Stefan Finkbeiner. I'm coming from the south of Germany. Likely I had the longest trip this morning coming from Stuttgart uh, <coughs> to EBSCON. Um, and I'm glad to be here. Um, if I read what, well, who am I, it says I'm the chairman of APOS. So not sure who knows about APOS. APOS is a European platform of smart systems. And um, basically, we are really networking and bringing industry and uh, academia together to get uh, the funding research agendas aligned and uh, make sure that we get also funding for what we are doing. So we are uh, at the beginning of the new funding area. It's not IPSE, what is specific in this uh, free A's what we have. Uh, it's a semiconductor guys of Aeneas. It's APOS and inside the software guys, which are asked as free entities, microelectronics, let's say microsystems, smart systems, and software to look for solutions, also for society 5.5, 5.0. Um, and that's about uh, KD, key de digital technologies on one hand, and also smaller projects, XECS, which we are supporting, and hope we can also give you some support in getting to funding possibilities in the European Union. So um, there's now role in, uh, when I have some time left, um, I'm working for Bosch Sensortech. Bosch Sensortech is a Bosch subsidiary located close to Stuttgart, Reutlingen, uh, where also IMS Ostrom has a small facility close by, and uh, there I'm also doing sensors, sensors, for example, for smartphones, for wearables, and I think these kind of devices are also a contribution to what Society 5.0 has to solve. So I want to hand over. Thank you. Thank you. My name is uh, Horst Pflügel. I'm representing AVL today. Uh, AVL stands for clean and affordable mobility. This was always our mission. Uh, that we followed. When I joined uh, AVL 26 years ago already, when I started electrical engineering and then automation technologies, um, I started there to, um, to optimize at that time the combustion engine. And uh, so we made uh, the combustion engine the, uh, the mobility cleaner over the time. And uh, this brought us uh, further in, in the evolvement, I would, I would say. And uh, 10 years ago, I moved into the central research where I still are. And in the central research, I came in touch first time with the electrification, with digitalization, with future topics that, uh, that are driving actually 
uh, AVEL now and also our all uh, future. And uh, we are doing a lot of research projects in these directions and uh, trying to develop this in the, in the direction that um, um, Tristan Hoax has explained uh, today in the morning. I think this was very good because he mentioned a lot of technologies that are already there. They need further improvement over the time because technology needs some time. But uh, this is uh, where we want to go as AVL, and so we fully support that vision. Thank you very much. Over to you. So finally, good morning, Michael Jerne. I will try to balance three hats this morning. One is me as a private person, hopefully still enjoying a few years in society, 5.0, let's see. The second is, uh, speaking for NXP Semiconductors, which is a key global player in electronic-based system, providing secure connectivity. And finally, the third head, also an important one today, speaking for the Austrian uh, <coughs> partners of the IPSE Microelectronics Consortium, which AT&S, Infineon, and NXP. Uh, we will come to that later, I think. I don't explain it now. But I think, Daniel, that's a, a, a good example of diversity management. I will, I will do my best. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, and I'm liking that now. When we, when we started off with feedback, and I, I'm seeing those questions coming in already, so that's fantastic. Um, we saw that 22.7% say, well, what is actually the Society 5.0? And maybe we can start off with just trying to define what it is. Who of you would like to go, go first? I mean, <laughs> I'm, 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 seeing, I'm seeing you, Stefan, kind of leaning forward a bit. Are, are you happy to define it? I just wanted to explain the nodding uh, before. I, we also want to know about society. <laughs> well, good that we're here. That <laughs> yes, but uh, honestly, I also have to say, uh, when I heard about Society 5.0, I also had to ask, so what is it about? And uh, if you read, uh, it's about uh, bringing also the technologies to solve problems of the society. That's what I read coming out of the information age. And now go to solve all the megatrends we heard this morning. And for me especially, it's also... Um, bringing the technical solutions to really a benefit for the people. I think this is very important. If you have seen the history, we had um, a lot of, let's say, information around right now. Nobody knows how to really deal with this. How do we make, do, do we make this personal? How do we make the, the information a value? How do we address megatrends? Um, if we talk about society 5.0, it's maybe about personal devices, which may help you if you are getting old, but it's maybe also electronic systems which solve really big problems. So the, the green energy topic. And to all these topics, we, have to, uh, uh, we are able to contribute. And the special thing for me is, it's all about also people creating solutions for the society, creating also social solutions, not only technical. And that's also a task we have to keep in mind as technicians. Thank you. Who would like to add to that explanation? Yeah. yeah Please, and then, and then very... But ladies first. Okay, go for it. Very polite. Okay. Uh, so I think the most uh, challenging thing you mentioned, and which was, is inherently embedded in this definition of society 5.0 coming from Japan, is to make these models human-centric. So society 5.0 is about a human-centric approach and model to solve social problems and challenges in an inclusive way, but also on the same time not sacrifice on economic growth. And that's the critical part, because an inherent uh, conflict of interest is built in if we look back into history. History has always driven, so technology advancements has, have driven to well-being of the society, but not equally distributed and a lot of social challenging topics have been created by this non-social context of the development. And that's, I think, the big thinking and this breakthrough of the idea, and it's many buzzwords, of this idea of having something which needs to challenge with inherently built in uh, conflicts of interest, which need to be solved. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to contribute, and this makes it all more complex compared to the past phases we were in, where the focus was really on getting into the next phase of industrialization over the past decades. Yeah. Thank you. 
if I, I may add, I think the, the concept of it talks a lot about co-creation, co-creating the future, and the point is who will co-create, will it, how much will it be technology push, and indeed who will talk for the use of a society. Is there at all a common uh, value set available, like we talked about the diversity? Will we have a European common value set, or even not in Europe? And I think that are the things to be considered. And I don't exactly know how it will be, but I have two wishes for society 5.0 at least. I hope people will be incentivized to solve the real world problems and not escape into the digital bubble because it's far more cozy there and it's easier and you can dream your dream easily and escape the real problems. So real dedication to solve the real world problems in this society and the second one that users and people, they still have a choice of how much they want to use on digital offers or whatever. So they still have a choice how to live without be, being burdened, <coughs> one or the other choice. This is my wish. Thank you. Getting nervous on that definition? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not getting nervous, but um, uh, being the kind person of I am, I'm not too happy with 5.0. Go on then. Um, because um, I'm an engineer, obviously. So if you develop software or anything, then you have version one, and then you make a better version is version two, and then you still make a better version three, and so on. So 5.0 somehow implies <laughs> it's a next version of 4.0 and 3.0. May, may I interrupt you? <laughs> because actually I've done it. The most popular question from this slot is, well, what's 1.0 to 4.0 then? <laughs> <laughs> so you're spot on. Um, actually, um, I have no answers what's 1.0 and 2.0, but um, I think with, um, at the current stage where we are with technology, with the know-how, with the capabilities we have as a society to spread knowledge and skills um, among us, um, it can be not only a continuous improvement as a step from whatever 4.0 means to 5.0, it could be an and really disruptive step to making things completely different that we did it before. So uh, we heard it in the talk before, there was a, a continuous uh, improvement in our society, in the industrial growth, to make things better, to make the world better. And there was one crucial things, a thing that was said, the goal in the future for probably Gen Z is to prevent the Earth from a complete collapse. So that's, I think, uh, a disruptive step in the next society. Thank you for that. Please, and, and, and maybe we'll just do Michael first because you, you, you know generation, uh, not generation, you know the whole society one zero to four zero? I, I tried to prepare, of course. Of course I mean, you did. You know, these were the hunting people first and then agriculture, in industrialization, information, and now Marvelous. the big bank. Perfect. Thank you very much. You get a, a star. Um, well done on the preparation. Um, <laughs> thank you for yeah. that. Horst. Good. Yes, I, I've also read this in, in preparation uh, for this meeting, for this discussion. I, I haven't heard that uh, word before. Nevertheless, uh, how I understand it is uh, it's, a, it's an intelligent <coughs> society. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is what I... What I uh, this is the main understanding what I have there. And uh, the intelligent society is the one which, which creates the future. So we talked about the future uh, at the beginning of, uh, in, in the first uh, keynotes. So what will the, the future be? The future will be what we make out of it. Yeah? So that means, uh, and if we, if we are intelligent as a society, we'll make a good future. If we are stupid, we will make a bad future. It's our decision. So it's nothing what we need to predict, actually. It's rather something what we have to work on. And uh, that means we have to use the technology. The technology is something what we have. This is in our hands. To use it in the right way. So technology is nothing good or bad by definition. It's something what we can use. It's just a tool. And we use it, if we use it in an intelligent way, 
and do the right things, we can make a good future. So an intelligent future, an intelligent society, this is what I understand, this is 5.0. This is what we should work on. So I'm liking that. So I've kind of understood, okay, 5.0 is like the logical uh, uh, step forward throughout our, our kind of huge steps we took in mankind or in humanity, which I think is the better word. You, you're still not happy on that. Yeah. Go for it. Why should it be the logical? I think that's an interesting point because for me, um, someone mentioned the word continuous growth and it seems there's this beautiful thinking of, of, of being linear in, in, in our thinking. And it seems that we're kind of saying, okay, so we'll just take step one, step two, step three, step four, step five, that's the next step. However, we're seeing at the end somewhere is basically attempting not to die, which is not good. Mm -hmm. um, so I see this as a huge challenge and a huge opportunity that we have all this technology at our hand to create a society that prevents the next generation of dying. My question is here, are we too slow and linear in our thinking to prevent that big bang that's potentially inevitable? Question to me? To whoever would like to. If you're happy to go, go for it. I, I don't think so. I don't think so. We are not too slow. Mm. Uh, we have 50% of technologies mature mm -hmm. in order to go towards the big ambition to be global, net zero, in 2050. 50% of technologies are mature. We need to deploy them. We to need to make them affordable, but they are mature. The rest, 30% are in the maturity phase, in the last phase before they are, they are deployable, and 15 to 20% are in the R&D. So we are, per se, not too slow. We are perhaps a bit too slow in um, installing the right uh, infrastructure or taking advantage of the governmental power to, to do this joint, uh, joint effort across the governments, across the countries, to really get prepared for it, to drive finance and to make it a big global movement with all members in and with full commitment. There we are too slow. There we are definitely too slow. So we're not too slow on technology, but we're too slow on... Absolutely. Well, legislation. 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 And society Government. potentially as well. Is society quick enough? I think in, in principle society struggles with this acceleration and the, we more and more move to exponential curves instead of this linear one, which is a real challenge, I think. And yeah, I think this societal innovation is certainly, and I, I, I support what Verena said, you can only, it's only one planet, we need to solve it in a global joint effort, and there, yeah, it's too fragmented still, and maybe the, the value sets are also still too diverse. This is not an answer and solution, but I think there we are too slow, yes. Thank you, Horst. Yes. So I would, I would say that society is, is ready to go in this uh, direction. We hear it every day. Yeah? So we, we hear people on the street. I talk with a lot of people. Everybody wants to go in this direction. Yeah? Young people, we heard that they are scared about uh, what happens if you do not do it. But uh, yes, as, you, as we heard in the beginning, maybe the little bit older ones <laughs> don't want, want to blame anybody, but maybe they are not as fast always uh, in, in, in changing these minds. But, uh, but, pro but I, th I would say the majority is ready for that, so don't blame any, any generation. I, I don't want to do that. So I think the generation is ready, uh, the society is ready for that, and what I think we need a lot of investments, yeah, because if we do it the way we have done it now, until yet, so there are only s very small steps. Yeah? Even, uh, so if, if you look in the electrification of the mobility, I mean, this, this has gotten a really boost, so this is really uh, accelerating very fast, but there, there are other areas. We need a lot of investment in, in all areas, actually, so the, the whole society has to go in this direction. 
And what motivates the society to, to go there or the business, yeah? We need the business case always. And these are probably some long-term business cases. That means we need some, we need some funding, we need some politics that stand behind that, who really help us accelerating in this direction to make this huge step. Uh, if, we have, if we ask economists that are very uh, future-oriented, they say in 10 years you make so much money out of that, whatever, hydrogen for instance, because everybody, the, those who look further into future already anticipate that hydrogen will be a multi-billion business, yeah? But we do sometimes, if we are in our daily business, we do not see that immediately, yeah? I don't know. Uh, this is sometimes difficult. Therefore, we need some investments, some, uh, yeah, some help in this direction. Now, we've just got a very interesting subject. We'll, we'll go to you, Stefan. I can see you getting very nervous over there, Michael. <laughs> However, I'd also like to kind of also touch, like, the implications of, well, EBS. Obviously, we're going we're gonna to yeah, touch that. Uh, Stefan, first. So coming back to the question, is the society ready? I think yes, society is open for all these discussions. Some of them are obvious, aging society, you can't avoid these topics. So the global warming, that's a topic I think everybody is aware, but we, between technology and society, there's also politics. And what I would like uh, also to, is to strengthen is the real discussion for consequent solutions. Sometimes we start topics like the electrification of the mobility, the cars, but we have to have the infrastructure in place. We also have to think about if some technologies are not a solution, for example, coal or whatever, what we heard this morning, what is then the real path? Um, so can we get enough energy out of what we do? And what are the key topics we have to solve? For example, storage for renewable, renewable energies. And there's something, I, my feeling is, yes, we start something, technology can solve it, but it's a whole ecosystem which has to be moved to these new technologies. And there I still see a lack of consequences. So you may have a lot of electric cars on the road in a few years, but do we have enough charging stations? Do we have prepared for storing of uh, the renewable energies, et cetera, et cetera? And this is what we have to drive. And that's maybe a technology uh, uh, topic together with politics. And my topic is, be consequent and be honest when you go down a certain path and then you are also solving the problems of the society. Thank you very much. Michael, I could see you in heavy thoughts. Always thoughts. <laughs> but I, I mean, maybe good. we <laughs> also do the, the, the connection of what, what electronic-based system or electronic components and system can do for it. I think it's a key enabling technology for sure. So I, I think we have a responsibility. We could make it easy and say, we do these enabling technologies, uh, the system integrators, the big platform owners, they make it good or bad. I think this is too simple an answer because I think at least in, in our industry we lay the foundation of the room to maneuver, be it in terms of security. Uh, if we don't build it in right at the start, at the enabling technologies, you cannot simply add it on top later on. So I think we have a responsibility as the industry and we take it, be it on energy efficiency, be it on trustworthiness as we discussed, to really uh, provide enabling technologies which allow this, uh, how to say, sustainable implementations and trustworthy implementations. So I would say a key building block or a key technology plus a, a big co-responsibility in shaping this future and not uh, just saying this is anyway like the bricks, use it for a house or use it for a whatever uh, church. <laughs> uh, now I'm, I'm going to get into the most popular question. However, I heard the word trust and trust is obviously something that triggers you a lot and your finger went up and your eyebrows went up. <laughs> I mean, sure, our... <coughs> Our companies are definitely dedicated to add trust. Um, if you see what went on on the, on the past years, um, our society wanted to get trust by uh, the mechanics of separation. Mm. So I trust uh, you if you keep three meters distance from me. Um, I trust um, in my own country, America first. Um, I trust in 
certain regions and build big walls to separate from other economies, to separate from other people. Um, so there is a, there is a lot of, of separation to build up trust. Um, and I think that will even enforce, unfortunately. And then we are talking about a global connected world. How, how should this work? Yeah. And I think technology as a neutral element, just being technology, could help to overcome this controversy, to add more trust, although there are tendencies to separate from each other. So we can help to not completely trust, but to add more uh, in, in this connected world that we definitely need. So there is no way around that we work on a regional, local level. That shows what the cluster is. Yeah, that's even on that tiny space, it's not Kerensi, it's not Styria, it's the region, yeah, that makes sense. And, and uh, it's uh, also, it makes no sense in, in, in the new economy, for the example, the automotive in industry. I own the car, I own everything. So now we are talking about a connected car that connects with the environment that uh, probably is part of a shared economy, which is part of a mobility solution, and it's not my car. So it's getting more and more connected, and I think this, this will be one of the topics once it comes to trust in the society 5.0. And I love this. That's a smart view. I mean, I'd love to dive into that. We might do that in a second. The most popular question right now, it's probably gonna go down that way anyway, is which current smart technologies will have the highest <coughs> the highest long-term social impact and why? Whoever feels obliged to answer it. Which current smart technologies will have the highest long-term social impact and why? That's an easy question, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It's good to answer on stage. That's, that's easy because um, this will be the green mobility. <coughs> For me, it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Yeah, I cannot say anything different, <laughs> but, I, <laughs> but I think uh, it is. It is not. Uh, it is not a lie. Yeah, uh, <laughs> because uh, it is. It is probably the most important starting point into a green future. So uh, you know it very well. Also, from the automotive industry has been blamed. Uh, really, really hard in the in the past years, and they are the ones. Uh, automotive industry always who was looking very far into the future and also invested a lot in in, in clean and 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 good technologies. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there's also a trust from the government and from from anybody else that uh, that the automotive industry can make it. So they said, okay, you have these rules, you have minus 55% until 2030, and uh, these are the rules, this is the legislation, please follow it. And we do it, yeah? We really, uh, we really follow this and we will reach it. There is a 100% a, a or nearly 100% guarantee that the automotive industry will do it. But what about the rest? Yeah. So I think you can also look at that. So the, uh, if you look at that, that's a good role mo model, the green mobility with the batteries, with the hydrogen. And this will be also very important technology for the other areas. So let's see. We'll get to Stefan and then Verena and Michael is here. I, also, yeah. I know, I know. <laughs> I feel it. <laughs> I, I want to add also another field, which is um, a lot of sensor technology you have around your body or in your body. And there's also discussion necessary, what do you do with these, um, let's say, signals you have? It's about security, integrity, it's about privacy, what is the new normal, which problems can you solve, for example, aging society, and I think this discussion has not really started, and that's something which will come up. So the mobility is in everybody's uh, uh, discussion right now, it's very important, it will also affect the people, but if I wear out of medical reason or out of a fitness reason some sensors on my wrist, maybe even in my head, wherever, what happens with the signals? Whom do they belong? Who can make which decisions, et cetera, et cetera? And that's not only a technical discussion. Technically, we can solve this. This is also a society discussion which we have to have. Thank you. Verena. 
Yeah, Horst, I, I, I agree to your view, but it might be slightly biased. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sure. Nevertheless, I think mobility <laughs> is probably one of the areas where we can measure easiest impact, as per today. Uh, it's easier to measure impact in, in the area of mobility compared to public health, for example. But public health is the other second area where I think the impact will be enormous. Mm -hmm. And here we come back to Stefan mentioning sensors. Uh, and I want to point this out. I think the impact of public health, implication of technology in public health, and all those different players in there, which will be needed to leverage that worldwide, that will be just enormous because it will be such a big part of our aging society and such a big part and contribution to how we age, how the millennials age, mm -hmm. age and how the youngs out there age and contribute. So this will be impactful. But no, no clue if that will be the biggest area. It will also depend strongly on the commitment, on the worldwide commitment and cultural com commitment, uh, which areas will be the ones where the impact will be most powerful. And we are talking about long periods of time. We cannot measure this in 10 years, but rather in 20, 30, 40 years. And the elderly uh, society needs also automated cars. That's also... <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Or drones, <laughs> not only cars, drones, drones also. <laughs> yeah, to add a bit to that, I mean, it, it is also a bit a matter of terminology, I felt, uh, what is a technology. Uh, this, I even feel these are sectors or solutions or uh, what we, on that level we talk, but intentionally become a bit more technical as just one example because indeed I think sensors. I, I want to add edge computing or secure edge computing uh, in a sense that I think we need to have good architectures in place, not to just send all data to the cloud, uh, cost far too much time, energy, whatever. So I think in, from a technology perspective more, which helps all these applications, mobility, uh, smart health, everything, uh, I think a good edge computing and power efficient edge computing uh, capability and to do that in a secure way. I want to give one example, just one example on a more technological layer. You can, can, could add a bit of AI and that to it, uh, local intelligence. But there is no one fits all and one solves all. From the, I think we need to, what we need is people <coughs> being able to utilize in a best balance all available technologies uh, to come up with system solutions which are well balanced and sustainable and also people really overlooking this whole field of diverse technologies because which are available. Because the interesting thing is to intertwine it with the most popular question now is we, we see, okay, technology is ready and available, okay, we're in a connected world, okay, we're seeing trust as a major challenge, however, we've understood so far that a lot of the, 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 the goals have to be long term and the big challenge is actually getting the laws and legislations into play and the most popular question right now is, from, from, from our audience, what challenges do you see around the safeguarding of democracy in the future? That's a great question. I mean, it, it kind of, because if we, if we take it maybe a step further and saying, look, we have long-term goals. We're talking 10, 20 years. We're talking about building not a local product, but a global product. Okay, fair enough. So that's also a societal challenge. What does it mean for people who are deciding, who are normally, and I don't mean it in a negative way, but who are normally used to deciding a lot more short term? They used to decide things in two, three, four, five years, and obviously, if you look at the roles of politicians, a lot of their jobs are also incentivized to create, well, a return which comes in two, three, four years. That's just my opinion, mm. um, which I shouldn't do as a moderator, but still my opinion. Um, sorry about that. So, 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 how do we take on that? It's an easy question, I thought. <laughs> um, I think um, we, we had, on the European level, KDT, etc., a lot of discussions also with the Commission mm -hmm. um, about uh, autonomy we can reach. And one, one of the questions, uh, or one of the answers, I think, uh, has, has been given um, in, in, in that sense that we need to know how to use, how to modify and further develop technology so that we are 
capable to understand what technology can do and not should do. Yeah? So we are, uh, are the operator of that, and uh, that means uh, that requires a more positive attitude against technology. Um, and that conflicts a little bit with the future, which is undefined, and everything that's undefined makes kind of a fear. So we, we have a tendency as humans to stay where we are because undefined things frightening, so better keep that, yeah? So what will be with the autonomous car? We will lose a lot of uh, mobility, probably, um, if that doesn't work out. Uh, what does this mean to the automotive industry? Um, I would like to drive my own car. Um, so a lot of questions saying, let's keep it as it is. Yeah? But if we do so as a society, other societies m might and actually do gain more know-how about technologies that they then control and they might misuse, as we, we see in, in, in other countries where democracy is not at that level that we uh, used to have. Yeah. That's my opinion. Which country do you mean? Um, <laughs> I know, I just wanted to hear it. <laughs> of course he means China, right? Um, Ish. <laughs> America? There are different views because uh, you might see, um, I'm, uh, I'm well connected to some people, Chinese people, and they say we love it because we have everything so pretty much under control. Yeah. Oh, that's also an interesting viewpoint. So, um, so the views might be different, yeah. That's, that's a good way of answering it. I mean, obviously we wanted to touch the topic of democracy and, and also understand what it is, the, is maybe our concept of democracy still fit to hold on, hold up to the massive and rapid and exponential change that's going to happen in the next years. I think I, I, would, I would like to see it from a different perspective. I, I would rather understand this uh, democracy, um, will we keep that? It's probably um, the, f their, the hidden fear of technology that technology might decide or the data that I do not have anymore in my hand. Maybe this comes from, from that <coughs> side. Yeah? Do I still own my data? Are I still the one who can take decision or is a computer or a whatever, uh, somebody sitting somewhere making decisions for me that I cannot change? Maybe this comes from this side. Mm. Um, this is what, at least what I would understand. And um, there the, the, the question will al always be, um, how do, does this further develop, this technology? And it's not a digital approach, so if you, for instance, mentioned before the autonomous car, yeah? does it work or does it not work? Yeah? And then uh, if you trust it and it doesn't work, then, then everything is dead. It's not black and white in my eyes, in my point of view. It is rather a continuous approach. So we will not have automated cars from one day to the other. I do not know if we even will reach the state of a fully autonomous car that can do everything. Yeah? I'm not, also I'm really an, an rather an optimist. I see what the technology can do, but can it really do that completely autonomous? So this will be a continuous approach. You get some further assistance functions. This is where, we, where it started off. Yeah? You said, okay, there is for instance, um, the, the, the automated braking system, ABS, yeah, in, the, in the past. At the beginning there was the discussion, some people said I can brake better with my foot, yeah, it's, it's, I'm, I'm very much faster. In the, in the meantime there is no discussion, this is absolutely necessary and, and everybody sees the benefit because it, it is better than a human being can react and this is for, for one uh, function after the other. This will be introduced slowly one after the other. Maybe in five years we will see cars that can drive the highway from Graz to Vienna, but not more, maybe just that. But this is maybe something very good, which you would use because you are often in, on the street, 
Markus, you will maybe uh, look at your laptop and sometimes look at the steering wheel because you <laughs> not fully trust it, but you will enjoy it yeah? because it's good. And this is the step price approach and there will always be humans who can interact and say, I like this, I buy it or not. Yeah? Like the, the young children with WhatsApp they, or, or whatever, they said WhatsApp is good. Or then at a certain time they said, no, Snapchat is better, or Facebook, I don't like it anymore. So they adapt continuously to that. Thank you, now we'll do I, Michael, I, I, then I want to come Stefan. quickly back to the question on Please the do. democracy. Um, <laughs> I think it's a indeed a lot about digital sovereignty I'm, I'm, that was mentioned. And I think in this convergence of the virtual and the real world, I think as long as the real world, and maybe it is a bit a conservative view, but I think as long as the real world is still the leading model and the digital world is supporting our lives, and, uh, but not the other way around, I think then combined with digital sovereignty and uh, having these mechanisms in place, I think then I would say we are comparably safe I don't know how the value sets will develop of people. And this is another aspect, not only the technology, but how do value sets develop of people, what will happen with uh, other mega trends in the world, and uh, is then democracy safe if you have a lot of refugees forever, things like that which go far beyond the technological uh, direct impact. Thank you, Verena, and then Stefan, and then I'll try and summarize. Perhaps to bring this, um, to get back on the balcony a bit and view, have a more holistic view on this democracy aspect and technology, the closing remark of the session before was quite impressive and I think it boils down to one essential thing, uh, this mega trend of individualization, which is something which is very much in sync with democracy mm. and I do not want to question democracy here, <laughs> honestly but also getting back into a more Eastern culture historically, namely that society as a community of individuals needs to be respected at all costs, right? That we, that we start thinking also in the Western hemisphere towards what the society goals, not only for each individual, but for us as a team in one country, beyond the country globally. And this is one of the, one of the big, uh, big things we need to rethink also from the political systems. And honestly speaking, sometimes I'm struggling because we, are, we could accelerate much more to solve challenges if just a government would be brave enough to take a decision for the society, mm. not for each individual. And I'm totally pro-democratic -democrat systems, but we do lose speed and we do lose opportunities to get to a better world in a quicker, in a quicker way because our governments are so much hesitant and there is missing intellectual bravery to solve things quickly. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> This is one aspect, being fast, uh, and that's of course a, 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 a big value which we have to also look at. <coughs> Sorry. But we also have to, uh, to be aware that we also need the minds and the brains of all the people in solving the problems. We need diversity in solving the problems. I don't think that there is only one way, and uh, that has to be also discussed inside a society. That's the other aspect. That was already discussed during the pandemic. How can you solve it better? And I think the answer is not really completed yet on this topic, and that's also about these systems. Yes, there are advantages if there is maybe a system which just defines what, is, what has to be done, but we have been very successful in having also uh, uh, discussions within the society and within the parties' politics about what is the best solution. And I would also assume that in future we need this kind of discussion. Maybe it slows us down sometimes, but maybe it brings in the end also the better solution. Now here's the thing, I'm going to try and summarize what we talked about, but I'm going to put the five of you on the spotlight. I'm a huge John F. Kennedy fan. 
and I loved the way he created the famous moonshot speech. I mentioned it earlier before. And I would give you the opportunity to form your own personal moonshot. Again, just to say a moonshot is something which is, it's big, it's huge. It's something where we don't even know how it's gonna work, but we're brave enough to formulate an idea, and by doing so, we make it a reality. So therefore, I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about your personal moonshots. Could be anything. And I'll try and summarize our panel. And if you're happy with it, you kind of nod with the summary. And if I've forgotten something, you're like, nah. Okay? That's the part where you nod. Don't worry, it's GDPR approved. Good. So we kind of set out to understand um, uh, Society 5.0 and also the impacts of uh, electronic-based systems. And when we started with this panel, we quickly find, found out that you're not quite sure what actually the Society 5.0 is. So we try and tried to discover it and kind of came to the conclusion that it's basically trying to so solve societal challenges by the means of technology and by doing so, making a, techno a society a little bit better. Obviously, there is a 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, 4, 0, uh, and so on. We understood that maybe some of the challenges are that they have to remain human-centric. And we also understood that a lot of the solutions, from a te technological point of view, are there already. They can be deployed. However, society could be ready, but the legislation is not. That, that's what we could pinpoint quite quickly. Um, said democracy, yep, yeah, we've got to have it, but sometimes maybe it's too slow and too sluggish because there's some countries and regions that are quicker, to decide, and that speed is obviously of the essence because we're not in a closed system. Um, we talked about that the different areas and different parts of technology, we, we understood that green mobility could be a huge factor in driving society forwards. We talked about sensor technologies on bodies and also the way that could not just solve personal health, but also the health of a nation, of societies that could help aging and so on. We talked about the challenges of spreading knowledge um, and the continuous improvement that we need to have there. Um, and we talked about the es essence of trust, because obviously trust is something that makes people believe in something. If they don't believe in something, they don't, don't do it. Um, we talked about the importance of diversity, obviously, because, well, these problems can't be solved with linear thinking. Um, and that big challenge could be that a lot of people have massive fear of the unknown. And if you do something new, new well, that's new, so no one's done it. So in itself, in innovation, there is always an element of fear which we need to tackle. We can only tackle that when we create not just small local products, solutions, but actually global. That's a bit of a challenge, but again, it's all about thinking big um, and being brave. However, we also understood that all of you, myself included, um, are strongly of the opinion that um, the solution has to be built within the real world, that the solution is not some kind of a metaverse or whatever, as Mark Zuckerberg is thinking. Um, so we're saying it has to remain human-centric. You happy with that summary? Yeah. Good, thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm loving the enthusiasm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not really, I, I think that's great. The others, no pressure, but you'll get your food in a second. <laughs> now it's time for some moonshots. Now let's see what your own personal moonshots are just to round it off. Who would like to go first? Okay, you go first, Verena. So, it is, it is a real moonshot, and I don't know whether this will ever happen, but you should never give up to think big. Um, the idea is to have totally rethought business models uh, in the sense tech industries next to automotive industries, next to tier ones, to our, our usual way of working and doing business as I grow, grew up in, and I'm still in there, it's not up to date any longer. If we really want to deliver on what is currently discussed in Glasgow, this will most probably not work out if we do not interconnect in a totally different way. But this is really, I, I wouldn't have the solution, and it's much more intelligent and visionary people who work, need to work it out for me but it goes in the direction of totally rethinking networking to jointly work on those goals. It won't work out if the government stays here, the tech company stays here, the financial market stays here, and everybody is working according to their own interests. Why? Because there is an inherent built-in conflict of interests. So compromises will be part of the job, 
but compromises are only taken, and we learn that in microsystems and in macrosystems, if we come to one table and the rewarding system is for everybody. So that's my moonshot. Not Thank easy you very to solve, much. food for thoughts. That's great. Thank you. Who would like to go next? That was almost mass, Verena. No, no <laughs> it's, I like it. I like it very much. Uh, my moonshot, I'm dreaming of a Europe which is led by entrepreneurs, uh, not by legal people and administrative people. So the entrepreneurial Europe and the Europe of talents and the Europe full of bridges. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Who would like to go next? You're looking at me. Okay. As usual in this discussion, I'm going to the different direction, down to Earth, um, <laughs> not towards the moon. Um, I would like to see more people not doing tiny Mickey Mouse steps further ahead, but really these parachute jumpers leaving the plane where they're actually in and explore a new way of flying. So I would appreciate if we have more people on every way uh, I think in technology there are many out, but we need them more in the society, in the governments, in the steering boards, but also in the big tech companies that still believe their business will go on as it was before, in the traditional old carbon-driven technology. Nice. Thank you. My mood should be if we really are driven from um, solving society needs within let's say, the society, the companies, and the politics, then I think we will also get the right drive to find the technical solutions. So bring the world together, it's the same sense, but if we can really bring, uh, 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 roll this out on the whole world, so we had just a climate conference, you see that not everybody uh, is really buying in into these topics. If we really fight as a society together with politics and technology for the solutions, then I think we are in a good way. Thank you very much. My moonshot um, is in the area where I'm expert in, so mobility. And this is strongly connected with the energy sector because we need the energy there. Um, the, the technologies that we currently have, the electrification, the, the electricity, the hydrogen, this will further develop to, uh, to such a maturity that everybody wants to have that. So there is no need for any further, um, how to say it, is supportive, uh, whatever, uh, activities, funding for the end consumer. I think this will go in this direction. And, and, this, and this should also happen to the energy sector. So because this is connected with each other. So the, fu the future that I see is they're full of, I don't know, maybe dis uh, distributed uh, energy production over, over, over every, every country with, with the green technologies that we have seen today, be it uh, wind turbines, be it photovoltaic, be it uh, wave uh, plants or, or something else, stored along most probably with the hydrogen, as a means, maybe maybe we have also biofuels, but this this mix this will be green technology. This is and this is something what is uh, maybe it, it's not even a moonshot because it's very realistic. We will have that. I think I believe in that that we will have that. But uh, it would be my personal moonshot. I would like to share it with you, make it also your moonshot. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Give it up for our panel if you feel like it. Thank you. <laughs>